All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us again for our webinar on investing basics today. Uh, my name is Josh Antis. I'm in the Community Relations Department here at California Coast Credit Union. Just want to say welcome and hope everyone's doing well. Uh, before we get started, just a couple quick things. If you do have any questions, please feel free to ask them either in the chat or in the question and answer box, and we will make sure to answer those questions for you at the end of the presentation today. Uh, also, uh, everyone in attendance today will be entered into a drawing for a $25, actually two $25 separate gift cards uh, to Amazon. So uh, just by being here today, you have a chance of winning. So I will contact the winners in the next few days for that. Um, and also this session is being recorded and we will have it posted on the web link that we have available to you. So um, I would say we'll probably have that up by Friday at the latest. So if you want to go back and get any of the info that you might have missed or want to review anything again, uh, don't worry about trying to get the slides or anything like that. We'll have a recording for you and you can go back and check it out anytime. Uh, so check uh, or uh, be on the lookout for that link uh, to that to the landing page that will have that recording along with all the other uh, financial wellness resources that we have available to you. I'll put that link in the chat box so you can check it out. All right. So with that, uh, I want to go ahead and introduce Sandra Torres. She is a certified financial advisor with California Coast Financial Services. And uh, she's going to be presenting today for us on investing basics or what they like to call investing 101. So, Sandra, take it away. Okay, great. Thank you, Josh. And good afternoon and welcome, everybody. Today, I'm going to talk about investing to help meet your financial goals. However, before I go any further, it is important to note that all investments does involve some type of risk and it is possible to lose money. Well, we have a lot to cover in this Investing 101 Basics for Beginners, so let's jump in and get started. So five things I'd like to talk about today would be why do we invest? What are some of the basics of investing, mutual funds, asset allocation, and why is it important to invest now? So why invest? Why is it so important to invest? Well, the reason why we want to invest is because investing can help our financial goals. So whether our goal is to buy a house, pay for college tuition, or maybe you're just wanting to save for retirement, investing can help our longer term financial goals. Let's talk about investing basics. What is investing basics? Well, investing basics, one of the basics for investing is putting money into CDs, but CDs may not earn enough. Most of you are already probably familiar with CDs, also known as certificates of deposit. They are usually typically used for people with short-term time horizon or short-term liquidity needs. They may, however, not be enough to reach our longer-term goals for either saving for college or saving for retirement because of the interest that we earn on them is so minimal. Well, what are CDs? So we talked about CDs being certificates of deposits. And then who are the ones that provide CDs to the investors? Well, there's only two groups or two entities that provide CDs to investors, and that would be banks or credit unions. So only banks or credit unions, when they wanna borrow money, they'll borrow it from their members or investors, and it's called CDs. There's also two different types of CDs. There are CDs that have FDIC insurance. FDIC stands for Federal Deposit Corporation. And what that means is when a bank is borrowing money and you see a CD that says 
CD FDIC insured, that means it's from a bank. If you see CD NCUA insured, NCUA means National Credit Union Administration, that means it's a credit union that is borrowing the money and that CD is from a credit union. So two more important things, if you are not familiar with CDs and who issues them, and whether it's FDIC or NCUA insured, the safety of it is the same. It's both backed by the government and it has the same safety and guarantees on them. Okay. The annual total return of, and this is six month CDs after inflation and taxes. So if we look way over here, 1997, we have this blue bar. This blue bar back in 1997 showed that a six month CD at that point in time was just under 6%. After taxes and inflation, it was still actually pretty good, which shows in this green bar, which means after taxes and inflation, then you still had a net profit or net interest amount of 2%. Well, things have changed quite a bit back then when interest rates were quite a bit higher. If we look, let's say, fast forward to 2010, it shows this little itty bitty blue bar and interest rates were at that time were at about 0.4% that you would get for a six month CD. But then if you look at this green bar right next to it, what that is showing is that after taxes and inflation, you actually had a negative return. If we look at 2011, 12, all the way up to 2016, interest rates are very low, inflation was higher, so you still ended up with a negative net return after taxes and inflation. If we look at today and we look at what our CDs earning, on average for a six month CD, you're looking at 0.2 to 0.3%. Now that's not two or 3%, it's 0.2 or 0.3%. But our inflation is higher nowadays. And we'll talk about that in our next slide. Inflation shrinks your buying power. So what does that mean? What that means is inflation shrinking your buying power means that the value of your money shrinks because of inflation. Inflation had averaged about two to 3% over the past 20 years. And I wonder if anybody knows what inflation today is running. Well, inflation today is running about eight and a half percent which is why the Federal Reserve is increasing interest rates to lower inflation. So what is inflation? In the news or if we're reading about what inflation is, they measure it by what's called CPI. What does CPI mean? CPI means or stands for Consumer Price Index. So what is Consumer Price Index? And what is it when we talk about it's at eight and a half percent? Well, the CPI or the Consumer Price Index measures what is called a basket of goods and services that is purchased by households. So that basket of goods and services, they're measuring, what is that basket? They're measuring the cost of food, clothes, furniture, um, vehicles, shelter, gas. So all the things that we will be purchasing. So if we have, let's say a 2% inflation rate, what that means is every year, the active good for food, clothing, shelter, gas, vehicle is costing us 2% more every year. So now we're at eight and a half percent. So you can see how all of that goods and services in that basket is costing us eight and a half percent. So that is what inflation means. And that's what they're talking about when they're measuring CPI. And that is why the government is increasing interest rates so when they increase interest rates, then the um, consumer will usually pull back on their purchases. For example, we had housing prices, and we still have housing prices moving up, 
we had mortgage rates of under 3% just recently. And now some mortgage rates are averaging over 5%. So at some point, that's going to eliminate some of the buyers being able to purchase a home because of the cost or the, uh, the cost of inflation and the rising interest rates has made it more expensive. So let's look at some other areas where inflation affects what we purchase or what we buy. So if we look at stamps, in 1996, the cost of stamps was 32 cents. In 2016, the cost of a stamp was 47 cents. Do you know what the cost of the stamp today is? Well, today, the cost of the stamp is 58 cents per stamp. And come July the 10th, that price is going up from 58 cents to 60 cents per stamp. So it's forecasted also that in 2036, the price of the stamp is gonna go up to 72 cents. So that's all part of inflation. Same thing happens with milk, same thing with a car, but I find this chart with a car in 1996, the average price of a car cost us $18,500. In 2016, it was about 25,000. I just looked at what is the average price of the car for this year, for 2022. And the average car, according to Consumers Report, is $47,000 is the price of an average car for this year. So I'm thinking either in this 2036 that's showing 39,000, either they're going to have to increase that or maybe they're thinking that there's gonna be deflation, but the price of the average car has gone up dramatically. So that's the cost of inflation and how it reduces the value of your money. Now let's talk about the investments and what's the three main categories or classes as we call it of investments. Well, the three main categories is stocks, bonds, and money market. So what is stocks? Stocks represents equity ownership in a company. Most investors will buy stocks because they expect the company to prosper in the future. They expect them to make a profit. And then in turn, the value of their stock price goes up. So that's why investors will buy stocks. Now bonds, on the other hand, are IOUs or debts of companies. Remember we talked about CDs when a, a bank or a credit union wants to borrow money, it's called a CD. Well, bonds are also IOUs. So if let's say Apple wants to borrow money from investors, it's called a corporate bond. So whether it's Apple or Home Depot or Walmart, if they want to borrow money, it's called a corporate bond because it's issued by a corporation. Now there's other different types of bonds. There are government bonds where, of course, the government is borrowing money from investors. And we'll see that either in government bonds or also called U.S. Treasury bonds. Other types of bonds would be when, for example, if California wants to build a new school or hospital or roads, then they'll borrow it from investors. And that would be called municipal bonds. So when you hear the type of bond, whether it's corporate bond, you know if it's from a corporation, government bonds identifies the government, municipal bonds identifies municipalities, CDs identifies that the issuer is a bank or credit union. So bonds, you usually buy it for a specified period of time. Let's say if you buy a bond for five years, let's say you buy Apple bond for five years, they're going to guarantee you a certain interest rate. And at the end of that time frame, the five years, and your principal is returned to you. That is what a bond is. Now, a money market fund is cash or short-term types of investments. And generally, they're very liquid. Those are the three types of asset classes. People will invest, again, stock in stocks because they expect 
the companies to make a profit and that translates again into a higher stock price. And over the longer term, then we expect the value of our monies to increase. Now, over the shorter term, though, it can be very volatile. So let's take a look at this graph shows an investment of $10,000 in stocks, bonds, treasury bills, and CDs over a 20 year period. The first one that we see in blue would be the stocks. That's this roller coaster type of ride. So if we would invest at $10,000 and at the end of the 20 year time frame, then the stocks would have earned about $44,000. And that's not with putting not $1 or one penny more into that investment. You just invest the $10,000 and it grows in compounds. It benefits from the companies. Um, getting more profitable and earning more money. That's what it ended up being after 20 years. So let's take a look at bonds. So bonds is the green line and it doesn't have like that roller coaster ride like the stock market has had over that 20 year time frame. And it also grew, but it grew to from 10,000 to 28,000. Then we have the six month CDs. We invested 10,000 over that 20 year time frame. It grew to 17,000. And then the last one would be the three month T bills, which is a government obligation called treasury bills that also grew from 10,000 to 15,000 with all that interest that was compounding. So those are the different capital appreciation potential that we've seen in the past 20 years, all the way up to December uh, 31st of 2016. Let's talk about the stocks and bonds and their best and worst annual returns over that 20 year time frame. Stock market, the best one year return in stocks was up 33%. The best one year return, if you invested in bonds during that period of time was 12%. So both of those sound actually pretty good. But what's the other part of this chart? Well, remember when we saw the stock market, we had big ups, big downs, but over that 20 year time frame, it averaged out to 7.68% return on average. Meaning over that 20 year period, even with the ups and downs, it averaged out to about 7.68% return every year for the past 20 years on average. With the bond market, you average 5.29% on average. And remember that one didn't have as much of a dramatic up and down, but it still gave us a pretty good return because of interest rates were higher. Well, let's look at the negative side of the stock market. The worst one year period during that 20 year period for the stock market was down 37%, meaning you lost 37% of your money in the one year. Let's see what happened with the bond market. Oh, the bond market, it ended up down the worst period of time. It was down 2% in one year. You can see that the stock market has higher highs, but also has higher lows, which means it has a higher potential um, risk. And then the bonds don't have as much risk, but they do still have risk, but not as much as compared to the stocks. Now that you understand the basics of the asset classes, which is the stocks, the bonds, and mutual funds, let's move on and learn more about the basics of mutual funds. And what are mutual funds? Well, mutual funds are actively managed investment companies. And what they're doing is they're pooling or gathering the monies of individuals and institutions to share a common goal. And that common goal could be such as like maximum growth, long-term capital appreciation, or it could be income, but it's pulling the monies of those individuals for that particular goal, whether it's I wanna grow the max amount possible, or I wanna be more conservative and maybe I wanna invest in 
more a larger percentage of my money in bonds. With mutual funds, you also have professional money managers that are working for you to build the portfolio of securities, whether those securities is going to be a portfolio of stocks or bonds, or maybe a combination of both, but you have professional money managers that are managing it for you. Few investors I find that have the time, the money or the resources to manage on their own. And that's why mutual funds may be a good option for those people that don't have the time or resources to want to do it yourself. Another, uh, another characteristic of mutual funds is that the share price is determined daily, which means in that mutual fund with all the underlying investments they own, they have to provide a share price. So they have to price all the um, securities and then provide a value of the entire portfolio. Another difference within the mutual funds is there's two types of mutual funds. One is called the open-end and the other one is called a closed-end mutual fund. Now the open-end is probably what most mutual funds um, and most investors have. The open and mutual fund, it means that you're buying and selling your shares on an ongoing basis to the mutual fund company. For example, if you have American funds, mutual funds, and you're buying their mutual funds, then when you want to purchase that mutual fund, you're buying it directly from the American funds. And then when you want to sell them, you're selling it directly to the American funds. And that's the same as with it, whether it's Fidelity or Vanguard, it's called a open end type of fund, meaning you're buying and selling that mutual fund from the mutual fund company that sells. Now, what's different about the closed end fund, what that means is the closed end fund has a fixed number of shares and you're not buying and selling it from the mutual fund company themselves. They have a fixed number of shares and they trade like stocks. So they trade on the open stock exchange and you're buying and selling them from other investors and they can trade at either a premium or a discount. They're also available, which is called closed end, but they're not as popular as the open end mutual funds that most people are familiar with. So what are the potential advantages of mutual funds? Well, there's quite a few different types of advantages that you'll find with mutual funds. They offer diversification. So a mutual fund can hold hundreds of securities or names in different industries that can help reduce the risk of holding just one position or one industry. So that's diversification among different um, issues, among different types of stocks or bonds. They also offer professional management. So you get that professional management by having the mutual fund. You have the convenience of being able to make one transaction and buy that entire portfolio of investments. And you can also sell it pretty easily. Affordability. Now that's important because if you have a um, limited amount of monies, then you're able to purchase a mutual fund and that will give you the professional money management, the diversification. Because can you imagine if you wanted to buy, let's say Amazon. Amazon, if you were gonna buy one share of Amazon, it's trading of about $3,100 for just one share. And then if you buy Google or Alphabet, then you're talking about one share having a value of between $2,500 to $2,600 for one share. So because of the prices are high of just those two investments, then it makes it difficult to be able to diversify if you have a limited amount of monies. So affordability, you can invest a small amount and get a thing for diversification versus having a larger amount and trying to diversify. Liquidity, as we talked about, you can liquidate it pretty easily, either by selling it back to the fund if it's open-end or selling it on the 
the stock market exchange like a stock. There are some risks involved with mutual funds. So let's talk about them. So the three major areas of risk with mutual funds is called principal or market risk. So principal or market risk, what that means is your investment can go up or down, meaning that it's possible to lose money. That means it's possible to lose money in a mutual fund. Interest rate risk. So what does that mean? What interest rate risk means is that with bonds is what they're talking about, interest rate risk. When interest rates rise, then the value of your bond funds go down in value. You're still getting that interest income or that coupon, that income, but rising interest rates create the value of your bond investment to go down, but vice versa. When interest rates are declining, then what that means is that you're still getting your interest or your income coupon or income. But when interest rates are dropping, then it has an inverse relationship, meaning that your bond fund increases in value. So then you have the benefit of an increase in value plus that interest income. That is interest rate risk. Foreign risk. With foreign risk, we're talking about uh, currency fluctuations. We're talking about social and political climates. We're also talking about what we're seeing now, which is Russia and Ukraine conflict, that foreign risk can have on your investment. So those are the three types of risks with the mutual funds. Let's talk for a minute about stocks or equities. We talked about stocks or equities as a class. Now we're gonna go a little bit more into dissecting it. And there's three major sectors or areas of stocks or stock fund investing. First, we have growth funds. So what are growth funds? Growth funds are mutual funds that look for companies growing at a above average rate. So for example, if we looked at Apple, when it was growing, like when it first started, or maybe a Starbucks or a Home Depot, um, they had very high growth rates when they're young and growing companies. Usually it's also technology companies or maybe biotech, but it's companies growing at a fast rate so they usually have high PE, meaning price to earnings ratio. Because of their growing quickly, then they're considered growth funds. Value funds are the opposite of growth funds. Now, value funds, remember during the pandemic, we had out of favor funds which would be considered like value funds, which during the pandemic, what were some of the areas that we're doing as well? Well, airlines, cruise ships, restaurants, oil companies back then might've been considered a value fund. So they have very low PEs and usually they're out of favor sectors. So their price to earnings is smaller. That would be a value fund. Sector funds. Sector funds is a subset of like the S&P 500. So instead of, earn, instead of owning the S&P 500, a wide variety of different types of sectors, you're only investing in a subset of the market, which could be, okay, I only want to invest in utilities or I only want to invest in technology companies or biotech or airlines. So there are sector funds that you can also invest in for mutual funds or gold funds. So there's a lot of different sectors that you don't have to own everything. You can just own that one particular sector if you saw value with just owning that and you thought that it was going to perform rather well. That's why some people will go into a particular sector fund. 
So those are different types of stock investing or stock mutual funds. Bond fund investing. There's different types of bonds. There's taxable, taxable bond funds, tax-free bond funds, and there's also certain risk associated with bond funds. Taxable bond funds. Taxable bond funds would be the certificates of deposits, corporate bonds. And what that means is that the interest earned that either the corporation's paying you because they're borrowing your money, they're gonna pay you a certain income or a credit union or a bank where you purchased a CD is taxable income to you. Those are taxable bond funds. Tax-free bond funds would be the municipal bond funds. Now, remember I was saying that if California wanted to um, borrow money from their investors, and they're gonna build a school or hospital or they're gonna pave new roads, municipalities can offer what's called tax-free bond funds. So what that means is that the interest that you receive from a municipal bond fund is tax-free on a federal basis. If you purchase, if you are a California resident, and you purchase a California municipal bond, then it's not only federally tax-free, it's also state tax-free. So investors that are in a high tax bracket may find that tax-free municipal bonds is of benefit to them because they're in a high tax bracket and that they are tax-free. We talked about some of the risks associated with the bond funds, meaning that when interest rates rise, the value of bond funds go down and vice versa. When interest rates drop, then the price of your bond fund goes up in value. Global investing. We have foreign stock and um, foreign stock and bond markets. And there are some investment opportunities. Let's talk about those. If we look at these different pie charts, we have the foreign stock and bond markets. And where are the opportunities? As you can see with this, that the US represents about 54% of the stock market, and then foreign offers about, it's about half, 46%. With the foreign government bond market, U.S. represents 34%, and the foreign market represents 66%. So there are some opportunities to invest in the foreign market, because if we look at, let's say, like McDonald's or Apple or Walmart, all of those find opportunities in the foreign market. And that's why they have their investments there. If they didn't see opportunity in the foreign markets or foreign countries, then they wouldn't be investing there. So that's why they're saying that there are some opportunities with investing in foreign markets, which would be the stock or bond market. Global investing, giving investors access to worldwide markets. So this would be all the different areas as the US and all the different areas that's available to have profits or income by investing in some foreign markets. So let's take a look. What's the best performing stock and bond markets? If we look at the best performing foreign markets, and this is from 2006 to 2016, you can see that it's not just one country that had provided the best returns. You can see that in 2007, Finland for stocks had the best performance, and then 2008, it was Japan. So you can see how it isn't just one country that it has changed 
on who has the best performing stocks. Now let's go to the bonds. The bonds, same thing. It's not the always the same, but we did have Indonesia for 2009, 10, and 11, and that had some of the best returns. Let's move on to asset allocation. What is asset allocation? Sometimes you might hear that term, you know, asset allocation, and but you're not quite sure what it is. Well, the definition of asset allocation is when you're investing your money in different asset categories that we talked about. Remember, stocks, bonds, cash, so that your portfolio is well diversified. The objective is to invest your portfolio so you can reach your financial goal, no matter what that is, whether it's buying a house, saving for college, or maybe retirement needs. The important part here, though, is that you're asset allocating and you're diversifying the risk so all your eggs is not in one basket and you're maintaining a level of risk that is comfortable for you which may be different from each um, and other people. So you want to diversify and not have all your eggs in one basket. So if let's say one particular company goes down in value, then that doesn't have a devastating impact on your entire portfolio. So asset allocation is very important. Let's look at the next page of why it's important. And this shows a chart that shows why diversifying is important. And it says because winners rotate. If we look at the annual returns, the best returns and the worst returns from 1997 to 2016, and over here, the best returns is all this top row in 2090, I mean, I'm sorry, in 1997, large cap growth stocks had the best returns. And they also had the best returns in 1998. But if you look at 2000 to 2006, they were almost at the bottom. And if you look at who the best performing sectors was, it went from large cap growth to small cap growth to small cap value, to bonds. So each of the asset classes takes their turn as far as who's gonna have the best performance year to year, and then also who has the worst performance. So sometimes the worst performance, like in 1998, 1999 was small cap value. And then the next two years, they were the best performing asset class. Let's talk about the popular strategies for investing. We saw in that graph before that the winners of every year isn't always the winners of future years. But let's look at what if you decided your strategy for investing was to invest in the winners. So if we invested in last year's winners, what would that have looked like over a 20 year time frame? So if we would have invested 200,000 and we chased the winners, meaning we always invested in the last year's best performing asset class in the future years, then you did make money. The value of your portfolio went up from 200,000 to 423,000 and you ended up with an average total return of 6.92%. So actually that worked out pretty well, chasing the winners. What if you had that contrarian point of view? So whoever was the biggest loser is the one that you invested for that following year. And you invested the same 200,000. You actually did better than by chasing the winners because your value of your portfolio went up to approximately 435,000, which ended up being average total return of 7.1%. What if we just did asset allocation, meaning investing over several asset classes 
And we didn't just invest in chasing the winners or investing in the losers. That same 200,000, the value of the portfolio was up the most at 465,000 and your average total return was the highest too at 7.5%. So instead of trying to guess if the winners are gonna continue winning or if the losers will be next year's winners, asset allocation across all the different sectors ended up being the highest return over that 20, 20 year time frame. Why invest now? Especially with what's going on in the market right now, we have the Russia Ukraine crisis, and then um, we also have the value of the stock market going down. So, why is it even important to invest now? Well, history shows that time, not timing, is the key to investment success. And that was by the late Sir John Templeton, who is the founder of the Templeton Funds and the former chairman. So what does that mean? What is he talking about? Let's take a look. So history shows us that it's time, not timing in the market is a key to investment success. Can you afford to wait? You have $10,000 and you invested that on the best and the worst days as measured by the S&P 500 over a 20 year time frame. what would that look like? If you would have put in $10,000 on all the best days for the past 20 years, then you actually would have done rather well. You would have accumulated you would have grown from 200,000 to 528,000. So that would have been an average total return of 8.8%. What if you were the worst investor ever? So you invested just before the market went down every single time in the past 20 years. Well, guess what? You, you would have still made money as well. Your 200,000 would have grown to almost 400,000 and you still would have earned about 6.6% over that 20 year period. And that's being the worst investor ever. And this shows that it's timing because of that compounding by investing, even if you're the worst investor ever, pick the absolute wrong time to invest, but because of that compounding and the underlying um, stocks did perform, and did recover that you still ended up making money over that 20 year time frame. So this is showing that it's not timing that you had your worst timing in the market, but the time, the 20 years of in the market made, that made the difference. What if you thought you could jump in and out? So you thought you could guess which would be the best time to jump out of the market before the market went down. So let's take a look at that. If you were jumping in and out and you missed the best 10 days over the past 20 years, then you would have only been up 4%. But if you would have just stayed fully invested, meaning you didn't jump in or out over that past 20 year time frame, you would have made 7.68%. What if you missed the best 40 days? Now this is over a 20 year time frame. If you jumped in and out, you missed the best 40 days of the past 20 years, then you would have actually had a negative performance of 2.4%. So what this is saying is that it's hard to time the market because if you jump out, you would have to jump back in at the right time, or you could stay fully invested. And that proved to be the best strategy. Some of you have probably heard dollar cost averaging. So what is dollar cost averaging? And 
why and how can that help me? So dollar cost averaging is committing a fixed amount of money at regular intervals to an investment such as a mutual fund. So what that is saying is that if you like, let's say take $100 and you invest that every month into a mutual fund, whether the market's up or whether the market's down, that is dollar cost averaging. What you do with dollar cost averaging, first of all, you start investing. So no matter whatever the time frame is, if the market's up or it's market's down, you just start beginning to invest. And then number two, you focus in on not what the market's doing or is that share price up or is it down? You focus in on accumulating shares. And then the third part of it is that you have to be prepared to weather the market declines. So let's see what that looks like. And market declines could be good, especially if you're dollar cost averaging. So let's see what that would look like. Here's the mechanics or how dollar cost averaging works. If we have a monthly investment amount of $500 that we're gonna be putting into a mutual fund from January through, through April, so for our first month, January, we're going to put in $500. The share price of, let's say, the mutual fund is at $8.50 a share. So with that $500, we're able to accumulate or buy $58. I mean, we're able to buy 58.8 .8 shares of the mutual fund company. In February, we're going to invest another $500 but the share price went up, meaning the value of the mutual fund went up to $10. So that means we could only buy 50 shares. So you can see what happens in March. It got more expensive. The value of it, of the investment went up higher. So it meant that we were able to buy less shares. And then April comes around. We put in the same $500, share price is 10. We're able to get 50 shares. Over that period of time, our average cost turns out to be 9.88 cents per share. And the reason for that is when I said the market goes down, because then you're able to buy you know, great companies at cheap prices, much cheaper than what they were before. So you're able to accumulate more shares when the prices were down. And when the prices go up, then you are able to purchase like less shares at that higher price. But during that period that you're accumulating, your average cost is less. That's dollar cost averaging. The important part here is that when the market drops and you're looking at your statement you're thinking oh my gosh I lost all this money I don't want to keep putting monies into it because I'm going to you know lose more why should I do that when we look back on some of the worst times even COVID when the market dropped 33 percent 34 we look back on it now and say, you know what, that was like the best time to invest. So usually when we look back at when the values drop, those were the best times to accumulate more shares. Let's talk about the impact of starting early and the hypothetical growth of $10,000 investment over a 20 year time frame. If we invested $10,000, over a 20 year time frame, And that, what that means is we put in $10,000 20 years ago and we didn't put in not a penny, not a dollar more. So that $10,000, if we had a 3% return on our money over that period of time, then it grew to 18,000. If we had a 7% return on our money, that 10,000 grew to 38,000. And if we had a 11 return over that 20 year time frame, then our $10,000 grew to $80,000. And that's because of the time frame and that 20 year time frame and the compounding effect 
of growing our money. That's the impact of the earlier you start, then the compounding helps us to increase the value of our money. So five key points to remember. Why invest? Investing basics, mutual funds, asset allocation, and why we should invest now. Action step. You don't have to go through this process alone. You can always request the help of a financial advisor, need help with whether it's college investing, investing in general, saving for retirement, or maybe you're going to be on the verge of retirement or just have some questions. You know, you have financial advisors that are here to help you. You can schedule a complimentary, no obligation appointment with us. It can be a virtual conference, phone, or in person. And then my information is on the screen if you have any questions or would like to meet. You know, I'm always available. So just reach out. Okay. All right. And thank you. That is the end of our presentation. All right. Thank you so much, Sandra. And um, thank you everyone for bearing with us. I know that uh, at points there was a little bit of latency. Uh, Sandra, would you mind turning your um, video off? I think it might help because sometimes you were breaking up just for a second. I uh, just want to see if we can minimize that right now. Okay. <clears throat> Perfect. Because uh, we do have some questions that have come in. You, you ready to answer some questions? Yes. All right. Uh, the first question was, uh, what are some criteria we should look at when selecting stocks or mutual and funds to invest in? So some of the criteria that you should look at when investing for stocks or mutual funds, it goes back to first we start with what are your goals? Before we get to the investments, our first point of information is what are your goals with these monies? What are you trying to achieve? What's your objective? And also what's your time frame? Is it a year? Is it two years? Is it 10 years? And what is your risk tolerance? Once we figure that out, then we can look at the investments that's appropriate for your objectives, goals, time frame, and risk tolerance. So that would be your first starting point. All right. And uh, let's see. What about uh, what about investing into life insurance since it earns compound interest? What is, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah. So life insurance is um, well. There's different types of life insurance. There's term life or universal life. So depending on whether you want life insurance for a just a period of time, that would be term life insurance. You want to protect you know, your family for a certain period of time, that would be term. Or if you want whole life or universal life, then that can um, accumulate um, cash. So it just depends on what is your reasoning for life insurance, but life insurance can be good for protection, protection for your family. All right. And is there a limit to investing in stocks, mutual funds, or bonds? There is not a limit. You can invest a million dollars, $2 million. So there is no limit to invest in mutual funds, but there can be some minimums depending on some of the mutual funds. Some of the mutual funds have minimum minimums of $250, some are a thousand, some could be 5,000, 10,000. So it depends on the mutual fund company itself um, as far as for minimums, but there isn't a maximum that you can put in a mutual fund. All right. Um, that question was from Maria who also had another question, are we responsible to pay tax every year or only when you withdraw your investment? So that is a good question. Depends on the um, type of account and where your investment's at. For example, if it's a retirement account and you have some gains 
um, within the IRA or 401k or 403b, it's within the retirement account, then you don't pay taxes on it until you take monies out. When you take monies out of it, then it's taxable to you as ordinary income. Now, if you have investments that is non-retirement, meaning in a taxable account, so you can own mutual funds in a taxable account. And if the managers are buying and selling, which they are throughout the entire year, and they decide, let's say, to sell Apple and Apple has a gain, even though you didn't sell any of that mutual fund, you will get a tax form because they're buying and selling within that mutual fund, which can trigger a um, taxable event for you, even though you didn't sell because it's in a taxable type of account. So it depends on the account, if it's taxable or a retirement or non-retirement type of account. Right, and uh, sorry, more questions here. Uh, our retirement date fund, or a retirement date time funds, I think just retirement funds, a good way to go. So I think maybe like 401ks or IRAs, that kind of thing. Okay. And I think what they're um, asking for is retirement date times fund. So what that means is I think they're saying um, a retirement target fund. Is, oh, and is that yeah. a good way to go? That makes and, sense. Yeah. So retirement target funds can be a good way to go. So what they are is that if you if you calculate that you're going to be retiring in, let's say, 2040, then what you're going to do is you're going to put your money into that mutual fund. And as you get closer to retirement to 2040, the managers will automatically start making it more conservative, knowing that you're going to be retiring and probably taking monies out of it. So it's a great way as a, like a one-stop shop to be able to put your monies in and then they will make it more conservative versus if you just put it in for like, let's say you have 30 years before retirement, you're investing it for growth, but as you get closer to retirement, then you're gonna need to make that asset allocation yourself. So if you don't wanna to have to think about it, you just wanna you know, focus on your family or your work and you want the, the uh, mutual fund company to, make it more conservative when they feel it's appropriate as you get closer to retirement, then it is uh, an option and an uh, option that um, can be a good one. All right, Alyssa, that was a question from Alyssa and she said, yes, that was the, her question. So target date funds, perfect. And then last question, cause we're running out of time. Are you able to take out a loan from your investment or against, against your investment account? Ooh, that's a good one. So if it's a 401k, and your um, employer allows you to take out a loan, then that would be a yes. Then you can borrow from yourself and pay it back to yourself. If it's not a, if your employer doesn't allow that, then you're not able to do that. If it's an IRA account, you can't borrow from an IRA account. So you can't borrow from it and pay it back. But I take that back. If you want to, borrow from it for a 60 day period, then you have a what's called a 60 day rollover where you can take the monies out for 60 days and put it back within 60 days. And it's not considered a distribution. So you could do that. If it's, um, if you want to take it out for 60 days and put it back. Other than that, for a loan, it would have to be in a, like a 401k or a some sort of retirement account that allows for that. Oh, and one last thing. There actually are investment accounts where some firms will allow you to borrow against a, like it has to be a non-retirement account, a like taxable account where you have your investments. They may have the ability to margin that account where you can borrow against it at a certain interest rate. All right. So, wow, we're at 1, uh, 1, 1 p.m. <laughs> right. Literally an hour's worth of uh, content. That was great. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you for everyone for uh, sticking around with us. 
Um, if you do have any other questions, I put the links in the chat for you. You can schedule a time to talk with Sandra or anyone on our team. Uh, it's free to have a consultation with them. So please uh, sign up. They'll they'll contact you and they can schedule one-on-one -on -one time with you. So you, you can talk about your future and your investments and what works best for you. But uh, in the meantime, we'll get this recording up on the YouTube link in the next couple of days. So if you do want to go back and review any of the info, we'll have it there for you. Uh, so thank you for presenting today, Sandra. And uh, again, thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you next time. Thank you.